um, and I love hearing different people's perspective and different views and seeing how the, the Spirit of the Lord is moving with each one. And Bruce, we don't want you to feel like you're not good, too. You are. <laughs> Janet just spoke from her heart last week in such a real way that uh, we just all embraced it. And uh, I think you two should do it together. How's that? <laughs> But what's important to us for our new ones and for those who have been with me long enough by now, you know that really, um, you know, as Bruce said, there's many different levels, there's many different ways to look at it, but there's one common, and that is the Word of God. That's what matters, and that's what we're here to do is to hold up the Word of God, to learn from it, to dive in deep, because there's, it's, come on in, the water's fine. <laughs> And we do a lot of traditions, and we don't stop and think about them. We light two candles every week. We light a third now, the third being for Israel. But we light two candles every week. And as I studied to review and, and all, I found out that uh, that's not necessarily tradition. It is in my realm and my what I'm accustomed to, but. There are some that just light one, and that really surprised me. And then a lot of the homes are saying, and I think this is newer, maybe not, but uh, anyway, that they're adding a candle for each child. And so some are lighting seven, eight candles now because I've got a, a card a card with four. And Bob makes 15. <laughs> <laughs> but I think... And it, what was brought down to me, what was passed down to me anyway, is we had two candles because we're always supposed to... Sir, what? has got it. She gets what the A. Yeah, here, here. <laughs> Observe and remember. I think we've got to put that in the other order. We always need to remember and then we observe. Or some use the word keep, but it's the same thing. And that comes right out of the scriptures. That comes from Shemot, from Exodus 20 and verse 8, that we're to remember. And the fact that we're to observe or to keep is Davarim Deuteronomy 5 and verse 12. I'll let you look those up later. But that's what traditionally I think most of us probably were raised with. And yet in my study and my research also, I found it very interesting that some say our two candles stand for creation and revelation. And I found that very interesting. We'll see if you think it's interesting as I go through tonight. But I will tell you that the, the regular morning prayers out of the Siddur, that when the Shema is recited, there's two long blessings given before the Shema and then one that's given after. And the two before thank God for creation and revelation. And then they have the Shema. And then the third thanks God for redemption and declares in it that he is the eternal redeemer. How about that? That's right on and that fits right where we're studying. Um, and redemption appears to be the common uh, answer to what's being revealed. What's the revelation? Sometimes I think we use our words and we don't stop and think about what those words mean, what they're standing for. So when we're remembering when we're keeping, we're remembering and we're keeping what's being revealed. Well, what's being revealed? What does that mean? You know, firing minds want to know. So again, in, Shemot, in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8, it tells us, and I'm going to read 8 and 11, but you can read all in between too. But just for sake of time, remember the Shabbat day. Remember the Shabbat day to keep it holy. For in six days, Adonai made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and everything that is in them. And he rested on the seventh day. For that reason, Adonai blessed the Shabbat day and made it holy. He separated it unto himself. There's our remember he created. Remember he is the creator. And then in Davarim chapter 5, Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 12 and 15, this is where we're told, observe or keep the day of Shabbat, set it apart holy, as Adonai your God ordered you to do. You are to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and Adonai your God brought you out from there with a strong 
or with a mighty, depending on your version, hand, and an outstretched arm. Therefore, Adonai, your God, has ordered or has commanded you to keep, to celebrate the day of Shabbat. That's why we do this, because mm -hmm. that's what God has told us to do. Remember and observe it. Keep it. This is what's important. And when we take that into our parasha for tonight, into Bo, which means go, Moshe being told, or Moshe, being told to, to go before Pharaoh again. I'm going to summarize it. I hope you're reading it. Uh, if you have it, you've got a week to read it till you're behind again next Friday night. <laughs> We're into the last three plagues. We're into the locusts, the darkness, and the death of the firstborn. By chapter 12, and Bruce has already said we're reading 10 to 13. By chapter 12, all that's left is the death of the firstborn. And Moshe has been told, go to Pharaoh. He will let you go this time. Because Pharaoh's got a nasty habit. Oh, yeah, you can go. Ah, uh, no, wait a minute. I've changed my mind. <laughs> and it's been discouraging to Moshe that he's being told, no, this time you're going to go. But there's very specific directions of what the children of Israel are to do before they go for this last night. And that is the, the blood that's going to be put on the doorposts. They're to eat the lamb with unleavened bread, matzah, and they're to eat it with the marar, the bitter herbs. Those are the three things that have to be on a Seder plate to have an authentic Seder. Everything else can be added in, but if you don't have those three, you haven't had a Seder. But we get the background. We get this, and stay with us long enough. If you haven't been to a Seder or through a Seder, come be with us, and you'll get a whole lot more than mm -hmm. the couple of sentences I'm saying tonight. But it's interesting to note, and here it cannot be dogmatic, but apparently there's at least an innuendo toward the fact that it looks like God changes the calendar. Now, I can't say that because I can't get before it, and I've tried all of my sources, and I've tried, I lost myself for hours, and I came out dizzy and was not aware of an answer. But there is just a slight, um, the, when you get into the Hebrew, it does look like that could be what God is saying. When he says to them that now will be, this will be the first day of the first month, Aviv, for you. Or Aviv, if you're looking at it in English, A-B-I-B, is, is really Aviv, A-B-I-V. Before this, if this is a change, then before they were going with the cyclical year of the agriculture. And that's what we're accustomed to when we think of Rosh Hashanah with, um, in, in the fall, is the agricultural, the end of all, and the start of another cycle agriculturally. Some call it civil, but that makes me think law. It really was more about the, the land. I cannot tell you that God was definitely changing it. I cannot tell you what was the new year for him first, because as you heard next week, we're celebrating the new year of the trees. <laughs> so you stay with us long enough in the scriptures, you're going to have four new years. So if you didn't get a good start, you've got another start coming. <laughs> but there is a hint here in the way that the Hebrew is bringing it out that this is something that's, that's it will is great enough to mark the change of the calendar. There's something that is great enough for God to command repeatedly for his people to remember it. Now, if God says it once, we know it's important. But when God repeats and repeats and continually tells you, you get the idea There's this is something of a bit greater significance. So what is being foreshadowed? What's this greater significance? The event that we know that either changes the calendar or that starts it, whichever way, whether it was or is now, is the creation of the nation through redemption. I'm not saying that Israel hadn't started. Yaakov is called Israel. He's had his sons. He's gone down into Egypt as 70 people who would have probably died, died out if they had not gone down to Egypt. 
and they're going to come out. The men that are being counted are 600,000. So they estimate two and a half million people are going to come out. You know, they've become a great nation, but they're going to come out through redemption. This is a key that maybe we're beginning to see and think of something that is significant, something that God is trying to bring to our attention. And he calls this month Nisan, or we call it Nisan. It's called Aviv in the scripture, as I said. And when we think of it being, okay, if you're looking at the start of the nation with redemption, what does that make us think? If this is foreshadowing, can we look to the future and can we see something that this could be a smaller picture of something greater but in that same line and as I search through my scriptures I come to the Brit Chadashat I come to Romans 11 verse 26 where it says that all Israel shall be saved or shall be delivered just as it was written and then Romans quotes for us my prophet Yeshayahu Isaiah and in Isaiah chapter 59 verses 20 and 21 we read that the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Yaakov. This is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And the word for deliverer there is the goel. So when the goel comes, and we, we are used to referring to the goel as the kinsman redeemer. So when the deliverer comes, the redeemer comes, we're going to see the nation as a whole delivered. Okay, I'm not talking about individual salvation. I'm talking about the nation as a whole. Verbiage sounds similar. Well, let's keep going and see what conclusion we come to. When I read verse 2 of Shmot of Exodus um, chapter 13, it says, This month shall be for you the beginning of months. That's easy to understand. We've got the first of the month here. On the 10th day, you choose the lamb. On the 14th day, you have the sacrifice of the lamb. And as we go through scripture, with the exception of Aviv, it seems that we always stay to the typical way of counting. And that is that instead of using Babylonian names for our months, we just simply say the first month, the second month, and we go on. Now this is how God has set up before, because I can take you all the, back, all the way back to Bereshit to uh, Noah's day, and I can tell you that the ark landed on, Ar on Ararat, on the mountain, we'll say anyway, on the 17th day of the 7th month. So it's the reckoning that's constantly be given. And it's very interesting because when you think of it that way, what it marks is you're counting time from a specific event something very important. Okay, we count that way with our weeks. You're used to being, I'll say it nicely, Gentilized. <laughs> and we say we meet on Friday night, okay? But in Israel, they're not going to say on Friday night. In Israel, you have day one, day two, day three, and you know what they're counting from? The day since Shabbat. We're one day from Shabbat. We're two days from Shabbat. We're three days from Shabbat. They're always remembering Shabbat. Okay? So if we're going to start counting our calendar months, we're going to start from a significant event, something that really matters to God, like the Shabbat. Observe, keep. Remember this. So keep that in mind. We're going to move forward a little more. We're going to have that last plague. We're going to have the great cry throughout the land of Egypt. I can't imagine the horror. Every Egyptian home, the exception were the Jewish homes and the few who were following the Jewish God by now, every home is going to be dealing with a burial. Every home is going to be hit with, with death. And they're to go now. Hurriedly. We all know this, they go so fast they can't let their bread rise, they couldn't, you know, pack up, they just, they had to grab and go, okay? The fear was that Egypt would hold them back again. Pharaoh said go, but we all know he says go, and then he says no. So they know they've got to hurry. Out of the death of the firstborn, out of the death comes the redemption. 
significant? I think so. Yeah. Chapter 13, verse 3. Remember this day in which you departed from Egypt from the house of slavery. For by a powerful, or by a mighty, by a strong hand, the Lord brought you from this place. Verses 8 and 9, you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. Uh, verse 9, and it shall be to you as a sign on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt. I am beginning to catch something else that's getting repeated again and again and again. God's making this jump out at us. If I took you to Dovering, Deuteronomy chapter 6, which you realize is not in our parsha, but if I took you there very quickly, you would see that the first few verses are telling the children of Israel the commandments that God has commanded them to keep. Moshe is teaching them so that it can go well with them in the land. The land that's flowing with milk and honey, the land that, that's all the promise, how will it go well with them? By keeping the commandments. Let me read you a couple of them. Verse 4. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. Hmm. I think I heard that on Shabbat tonight, Lord. I think it started our Shabbat. I think we're ushering in and we're remembering, Hear, O Israel, the Lord of God, the Lord is one. 5 and 6 of chapter 6 of the Rim says to teach them to your sons. Now, I was just reading that in Shemot, that they were to tell their sons. And of course, sons means they're the children. It's passing it on down. It, it, it includes the girls, okay? How are you to teach them in Dalvarim chapter 6? You're to teach them at home. You're to teach them when you're traveling. You're to teach them when you lie down. You're to teach them when they get up. In verse 9, you're to hang it on the doorposts of your homes your gates so that when you're coming in and you're going out and you're up and you're down and you're traveling in your home or wherever you are your mind is being drawn to the word of god you're teaching it to your children and if that's not enough verse 8 you shall also tie them as a sign to your hand and they shall be frontlets on your head well did you remember when i read out of Shemot that it was to be a sign on your hand and a memorial between your eyes I've got same language. God is repeating it again. Verse 20, when your son asks, hello, chapter 13 of Shemot, when your sons ask. Verse 21, back in Dabarim, then you shall say to your son, when we were slaves to Pharaoh in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt, how? With a mighty hand. You hear it again and again and again. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. It emphasizes when it's repeated. And if I took you to Dovarim chapter 11, it would be all over again. Verses 13 to 21, you can read them on your own. So we're hearing it, we're hearing it, we're seeing it. We're beginning to tie things together. Some of us, you know, need the dots connected a little better than others. But God is giving it to us. Simple enough the children can understand it. And it's interesting when we think back to those three blessings with all of our morning prayers, not just on Shabbat, this is every day of the week, day one, day two, day three, that the blessing is praising God for ordaining the order of creation, for renewing creation, there to hallow the Creator, and it ends with praising the Lord, the Creator of the lights, for blessing number two, bringing us revelation. We're to praise God for revealing to us. Well, what's God revealing to us? Blessing number three, the eternal redeemer. Notice key word again, go well. The eternal redeemer, God, the God of our ancestors, our redeemer, our creator. There is no God but you. We say this every morning if we're doing the morning prayers. You, the help of our ancestors, you rescued us from Egypt. Here we go again. 
Egypt keeps coming back up and it keeps coming back up. You brought us out of the house of bondage. The firstborn of Egypt were slain, but ours were not. And it continues through the rescuing in the Red Sea, or through the Red Sea, I should say, be, be correct, Rochelle, and the drowning of the Egyptian army in the Red Sea. And then it winds up praising God, supreme, holy one of Israel, Adonai Sabaoth, the redeemer of the people of Israel. I see the repeat, I see the constant, I see the continuous. We've got these markers. It does make me wonder, did God mark the calendar now by this date? You know, we mark our calendar, Gregorian, we mark it AD and BC. And I don't care if they do try to say before the Common Era, which is the way they try to say it today, you still have to know that calendar was changed because of the date of someone significant in history. And if you don't know who I mean, stay tuned, because I think you all do. <laughs> it wasn't before the Common Era, I'll put it that way. So we've got something significant happening here. We've got all this repeating. We've got these blessings, and these blessings are always referring to God, our Creator, the Creator of it all, and for God redeeming us out of Egypt. I think we're beginning to know what we're always supposed to remember. And oh, by the way, I imagine Janet will attest to this also, that that's what we were taught for every Shabbat. You have to always mention God is creator and he's brought us out of Egypt. We've got to remember that every Shabbat. And I even remember being told that's why there's two candles. You know, we've got three Jews, we get four opinions. But anyway, mm -hmm. how many times do we need God to repeat it? I'll give you Davarim, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 7. Repeat them diligently. You know who said that? Mm -hmm. God said that. Mm -hmm. He said, repeat it. Repeat it. How do we learn? Repetition. Mm -hmm. And then it says, sit in your house. Walk on the road. When you're lying down. When you're getting up. And now... God gives it to us in 3D. You know, if you're taught to be a good teacher, you're taught the more senses that you can touch, the hearing, the seeing, the feeling, the tasting, the more that you can touch, the more likely your students are to remember. So God's saying it, we're hearing it, we're reading it, we're seeing it. This isn't something we can quite taste yet, but we're not necessarily feeling it yet either. So what does God do? I'll give you an object lesson. I'm going to give you something so that you can feel it. And I'm going to let you feel it. I'm going to ask you to be very careful with the small ones that don't go around the room. I've got another set that I'll start on the other side. But this is called to fill in for anyone who doesn't know. And the reason I'm saying please be very careful is these were given to my Abba, my dad, when he was bar mitzvah at 13. They're just now close to 100 years old. So that's why be a little careful, but you can see them as I'm talking about it. These go back to, my dad was born in 1916, so this was 1929. Uh, I have another set that's a little bit bigger. It's a little more colorful, which they tended to do a little later. 1929, you've got um, the depression going on. I think they were a little more conservative, but that isn't what matters. What will matter is what's on the inside. Now these, I'm going to leave up here, you can see them later, they're covers that were given on this set. But here's another set. Yeah, you can just pass them down and I'll start this on this side. Okay, now, I'm not taking the time, but the straps that you see, they were to take these and the smaller one is for the head and it will lie right on the crown right where the hairline, right on the crown, or where the hairline was. <laughs> and the straps will go to the back. Some wear them out to the front, but there's a knot to the back of the neck so that it hangs right between their eyes, a front lip between their eyes. The larger one, they take and they put it on the, the if they're right-handed, they put it on their left, vice versa, otherwise. It is to be pressed into the heart, though. So in my dad's tradition, and the way that he was taught in Orthodox Judaism, it didn't matter if you were right or left-handed. You always put it on the left because it was to press into your heart because you were to hide God's word in your heart. 
So that's what was uh, given. We read about tefillin in, in Shemot, in Exodus 13. Oh, by the way, they take that, they wrap it seven times going down the arm. And then I'll tell you a little bit more about what they do with it on their hand in just a moment. But in those little boxes, they've written the scriptures from Shemot, Exodus 13, verses 9 and 16, and from De De Deuteronomy, Dabarim, chapter 6 and verse 8, chapter 11 and verse 18. Okay? Now, I've got to tell you to appreciate what you're looking at. In the, the, the one that goes on the arm, okay, i got to get it right, which one? One of them has, and I thought I knew this better than the back of my own hand. Um, okay, the head one has four sections in it. Okay, the, the hand one, the one that goes into the, the heart, is only one compartment. But the head, even though it's small, there are four compartments in there. It's sealed up. You can't tell. Okay, but it's sealed. This has been, those, those compartments each have those scriptures. They also have some other scriptures. They are, the leather comes from a kosher animal. They are written by a sofer. The sofer has been highly trained how to write the Hebrew letters, no mistakes, no missing, nothing. Do you know how many letters are in each one of those boxes? 1,594 letters. And if you've seen the Hebrew, you know how blog Hebrew, how beautiful it is, but how tiny it must be and with no error. And they will count the letters at the end to make sure that, they, that there's nothing missing and nothing added. If it's one off, it's out the door. So the next time when you lose your teeth over what one of these cost, <laughs> realize why they're so costly. The hours, the time, what's been put into it, it, it's just amazing, and I'm only giving you highlights of it. They wear them traditionally during the morning services. They can put them on any time between sunrise and sunset, but they're to, to wear them continually because they're to be being reminded continually. So now God's really given them, and this is done by the men, by the way. The boys, as soon as they're going to be bar mitzvah, they start getting trained how to wrap it, how to do it. Um, and I've got my, I don't want to forget to tell you, the way they take it and they form it on their hand, again, sometimes it's traditions, what comes or what doesn't come um, down to you. You can do it the way your family was. Are we okay to go on? Do I keep going? No, yeah. Yeah, I, he's, okay. I don't know what he's doing. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to go on. I'm going to ignore them. <laughs> <laughs> for my dad, it was on the palm of the hand. Now when I look for for teachings, they put it on the back of the hand. I don't know which way you saw it, Janet, but the way that they would form the straps would be three long straps coming down, and it was wrapped around also so that there was a base, so it looked like the sheep, the letter Shin, which stands for God. And it's also the first word, the first letter in the word Shaddai, which El Shaddai, Almighty God. I think he's trying to call it the picture for you. I'm yeah. not sure, but anyway. Um, and uh, if you see them wrapped around fingers, they're making the dalit, they're making, you know, every letter so that they spell out all of Shaddai now. My dad didn't spell it all out, but he had the letter Shin and he knew it stood for God. But the interesting thing is that as they're wrapping this on, they quote Hosea, chapter, twi uh, sorry, chapter 2, verses 21 and 22. I betroth you to me forever. I betroth you to me in righteousness, justice, loving kindness, and mercy. I betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you will know the Lord. So this is what the Lord is saying to his people as they're wrapping themselves up. And what do we use the word betrothed for? Wedding. Wedding. It's like a covenant. It could be like the ketubah. When you know that, and you know that the word that is a mitzvah, to put on the tefillin, which means it's a commandment. A mitzvah is a commandment that we're to do. When you know that the root of mitzvah is tzavta, tzavta. I have a hard time. T Z A V T A. Okay, so I've got to get that T Z sound in there. Zavta. There's a there's a vav. Yes, there's a vav. You don't have to see it. Okay, okay. I'll show you later. 
let me tell you in English, the word means connection. Mm. God isn't just saying, you do this. He's making a connection. He's making a covenant. He's bringing you in as if a marriage ceremony. And when you remember that Israel's called the wife of Yehovah, yes. you get it. It's all coming together. That mitzvah, when you're putting it on, following God's commandments, ultimately you're binding yourself to God. And he's telling you that he has bound himself to you. That's what's behind this. Not just to put them on ritually, but to realize, to think, to say, to hear, to feel, to touch, to know. You're dedicating yourself to the service of your God. You're dedicating yourself to be connected to your God. And then, because we are so big on passing it down to our children, remember, tell your sons, tell your sons, tell your sons. Then they tell you, if you do this, you're doing the same way your grand, your father, your grandfather, your great-grandfather did it because it's being passed down. And if you'll do it, it's likely that your son and your grandson and your great-grandson will do it. So you're connecting the past and the future, and you are passing it down. And when you do this, teach your children. Teach them what we're to remember. Teach them what is important. Teach them that God brought us out of Egypt. And did you notice a key word in my sentence? I didn't say God brought them out of Egypt. That's how we're taught to teach it. God brought us. We were there. We were in the loins of Avraham. We were in the loins of Moshe, Abraham, Moses. We are to always phrase it that way. It's always God brought us out. And how did he bring us out? What's the phrase? With a mighty hand, with a powerful hand. And when we look at the root word, every time it says that in scripture, the root the word is hazak. The word is strong. The word is mighty. Why does it say a mighty hand? And, well, let's look at how God brought us out, okay? Let's look at what God says about the hand in Scripture. Because remember, we use Scripture to help us understand Scripture. So when I look at hand, I think of Yochanan. I think of John in the Brit of chapter 10 and verses 28 and 29. I love chapter 10. You've got your shepherd. You've got so many pictures, so many analogies. It's great. But I want to bring you the one that talks about the hand. In chapter 10, starting with verse 28, Yeshua is speaking, And I give them eternal life. They'll never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Here's another place, proof that Yeshua claimed equality with Yehovah, and he had every right to because... He and the Father are one. But do you notice how he says, you can't be snatched out of my hand. You can't be snatched out of my Father's hand. Do you know what the strongest part of your body is? It's your hand. It's your hand. Think about it. You can clench something that's so tight. Even a little child can clench his fist and try to peel those fingers open. <laughs> now, if you put something under your arm, it can be pulled out. If you put it between your legs, you can drop it. But if it's clenched in the fist, that's the strongest part of the body. You know, there are 30 muscles in the hand working together in a highly complex way to give that power grip and a precision grip. You can do something very precise, and you can do something very large with the grip of your hand. And I think of that hand. Yes, Dr. And, Bruce? And the grip strength that you have is a predictor of how healthy you are. Yes, I of even what? read that, of how healthy you are. Your grip strength, if, if how strong you can If your grip is strong, it's because you're healthy. If your grip is weak, you're not That's healthy. Right. And God is never not healthy, so his is always strong. And I love to think I brought out last week, Proverbs 30 and verse 4. We brought out all the way to the end that the answer is God, the, the phrases that we're describing him, who has gathered the wind in his fist? Yeah. His fist. 
Yeshua, Isaiah 41.10, I will also uphold you with my righteous right hand. 48 and verse 13 of Yeshua, Isaiah, Assuredly, my hand has founded the earth, and my right hand spread out the heavens. When I call them, they stand up together. Heaven and earth in his hand. Mm. And then I love, this one just gives me chills as it brings it home. Chapter 49 and verse 16 of, of Yeshua, Isaiah. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hands. And it's very easy to, from those Hebrew root words, to take that word inscribe and see it two ways. One is indelibly inked. You ever try to get indelible ink out? Right. You can't. <laughs> you can't. You can't. <laughs> you can't. It's indelible. Or you can look at it with the word engraved. Mm -hmm. And if you think engraved, I will tell you that the tool used to engrave was a nail. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Davarim, Deuteronomy 5, verse 15, mm -hmm. added another phrase that he brought us out with a mighty powerful hand, and with an outstretched arm. Remember, we're looking for what we're to remember, how it's to relate, how does this all come together, what are we remembering? We've talked about two things that we're always to remember. He's the creator, he brought us out of Egypt. But mark the counter because it's the redemption of the nation coming out from death into life. And now we've got an outstretched arm. Where have we read this before? And it's not long ago. It was our last parasha, chapter 6 of Shemot, of Exodus, chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, which we tie in with every Pesach, gives us our four cups. Mm -hmm. The third cup, that cup specifically called the cup of redemption, same language, says, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm. Hmm. Let me take you to Brachar Shah because we've got one book, folks. Quit saying it's two. It's one. It's a long, continuous yeah. story. Luke 22, verse 20, in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, so we know it's the third cup, and he says, this cup, which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. With that outstretched arm, he shed his blood that is the cup of redemption that we remember and recall every time we do Pesach. And what's the picture of Pesach? The sacrifice lamb. What came out of death? The birth of a nation, yes, but are we seeing a greater redemption? Are we seeing the redemption of our souls from sin? Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Wow. I don't know about you, but I see a great tie-in. I see God putting a bow on top. He has tied it all together. He has put it together. So we remember God. We remember God created we remember that God brought us out. We remember that God redeemed us with an outstretched arm. So we don't stop with just God redeemed us out of Egypt. He redeemed us from our sin. Wow. That's what we're to wrap our brains around. That's what's to be pressed into our heart. That's what we're to recall and remember. And it's all wrapped up in the mighty hand of our God. Mighty and powerful to save. Amazing. Mm -hmm. Little more detail. When the people were being redeemed, being brought out of Egypt, Moshe took his rod. But our scripture says he stretched out his hand. He didn't stretch out the rod. He stretched out his hand and he lifted up the rod and the Red Sea parted. Mm -hmm. Moshe called 
a redeemer because he redeemed the people is a picture of the redeemer who splits open the way to have your sins removed buried in the deepest of seas because those waters will come back down and drown the Egyptian army but he paves the way to the promised land and he did it with an outstretched arm and he keeps you in his hand yes he does Seha Elohim, Lamb of God. This is pre-Levitical priesthood. You don't have the priesthood yet. He was after the order of Melchizedek. My God is righteous. This was a direct oath from God. This predated all of that, and it was set up to point to the coming Messiah himself. I think he might have changed the calendar here. And if he did, that's the pivotal point. Very interesting that the calendar's changed again on a pivotal point of this. This man slash God. 100% God, 100% man. They call him the 200% man. <laughs> <laughs> it's all summed up in the fact that this is what is being revealed. The revelation. And when I hear that, I think, yes, our last book in our one Bible is the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. Ding, 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 we've hit the bell, folks. It's all there. It just all comes together. And that's why I think the Exodus out of Egypt is such a fundamental event, so important to us. It's the central theme of our scriptures. Let me just tell you real quickly, we remember in Passover, I've already given you scriptures in Shemot. They're also in Bamidbar, in Numbers. They're also in Davarim, Deuteronomy. They're explicitly mentioned before the first commandment is given. Go read Shemot, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 2, and you'll see the reference to Pesach. You'll see that it's recalled every Shabbat, Deut Deuteronomy 5. You'll remember at Shavuot, we remember the giving at Mount Sinai. The same way we were in Egypt, what else do we say? We stood at Mount Sinai. We were there. We're always saying it that way. That's the way God taught us to say it. We recall Passover, Pesach, at Sukkot, that God brought us through the wilderness journeys and brought us through safely when he brought us out of Egypt. We remember it during the season of Teshuvah. We cry out to be redeemed. We remember it as it culminates in Yom Kippur, the atonement, as I already showed you, from the outstretched arm, the cup of redemption, the shedding of the blood. We see it in almost all the commandments of the Torah. They're including laws in, for our tabernacle, but it all goes to the sacrificial system. The sacrifice came from Shmot. It came from the Exodus out, the Passover lamb. This was the first one. It all goes back to that. So the Exodus prefigures, the Exodus exemplifies, the Exodus is the redemption. It is the sacrificial life of Yeshua. That's what we're seeing right now in our parasha. That's what we're going to keep seeing. That's what we're to remember. That's what we're to recall. Remember, we, he's creator, but he's redeemer. And we're to remember those two things. There's a revelation. What's the creator re revealing to us? Redemption in the Son, in the sacrifice. And I want to say, when we realize this, when we realize that the exodus out of Egypt leads us to the Lord, leads us to the Redeemer, leads us to the Redeemer of Israel, I want to say to my beloved Israel today, you know what? God doesn't take kindly to oppressors. Hamas, you're on notice. God judged Egypt for oppressing my people. God will judge Hamas. He will judge them for their oppression, for their violence. And one day, there will be justice served. And when we see our Messiah sitting on the throne, he judges with a rod of iron to keep the world in line so that there might be peace. He promises Israel that. I will sit on David's throne. There will be a thousand years of peace. And he promises it all over. But hear me in Jeremiah 16, 14 and 15 yes. says, Therefore, behold, 
Hello, behold, remember, wake up, don't miss this. If you're sleeping, hear it. Days are coming, declares Adonai, when it no longer will be said, as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. We're not going to keep saying that. You know why? Because we got a new phrase. But we're going to say it as the Lord lives who brought up the sons of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had banished them. For I, God, Adonai, will restore them to their own land, which I gave their fathers. Amen. Hallelujah. Yes. Amen. Israel, Amen. there's your final chapter. That's where we're headed. Our redemption pointing to Yeshua pointing to the sacrificial lamb, pointing to his coming, pointing to him ruling and reigning, pointing to him as king, pointing to him as his kingdom on earth. Wow. Amen. And you know what? If you're plugged into this, then you get to be part of it. If you're a citizen of heaven, because you put your trust in Messiah as your redemption, then you're a citizen of heaven. You're not a citizen of earth. Amen. Heaven is your home. You're just passing through here. Yes. And you are Amen. never a slave. Amen. You are joint heirs Amen. with Yeshua. So Israel is going to come and receive her earthly promises, and we are going to be there ruling and reigning with our Messiah. Amen. What a plan. I'm going to sum it up here, and I've got to quit. I see that. I hate that clock. <laughs> I'm just getting going. I've got to quit. I'm going to take you to a traditional Haggadah. That's the, the, what we follow when we do the, the Passover. Okay, the telling, you know. But I'm wondering what's in your mind of, of the traditional one. You'll have to tell me later what, what jumped into your mind. Four kinds of children are described at the Seder table. The first child is unable to ask, doesn't understand, doesn't realize there's a meaning behind the Seder. It's just a ritual. Okay? Second child is a simple child that goes along with it, but doesn't bother to look beneath the surface. Doesn't look for meaning, doesn't really get what's going on. It's not relevant to the second child. The third child is called Rasha, alienated, distant. It's a stranger at the table. He wants to hear a different story. Come on, I don't want to hear this. Tell me something new. Okay? And the fourth child is the wise child. The fourth child humbly asks. I hear that one asking our four questions that make us tell the story again. He seeks, he desires to understand the mystery. And he wants to know the truth. He wants to know what's behind Pesach. What's behind God changing the calendar? What's behind? What's God revealing? That, that child asks the questions that leads him to the answer, and the answer brings him the redemption of his soul. Now, we were there as slaves in Egypt. We are redeemed not by Moshe, but by the outstretched arm, and we know that that's a picture of Yeshua. I brought that up clearly. We were at Mount Sinai when we were given the commandments. That means we also were at Golgotha, another mountain where Yeshua gave his life in our place. Are we one of these four children? Are we one, unable to ask? Don't even have a clue, don't even know what to ask? Are we not bothering? It's not relevant to me. It's not gonna help me today. I don't care so much. Are we alienated? Are some of you thinking tonight, I wish you would shut up? I wish you'd talk about anything else, but isn't it time to go home? <laughs> or are we wise enough to seek, to ask, do we have a desire to understand, do we want to know the deeper meaning? Because it's woven all the way through Scripture. I've taken you from Bereshit, Shmot, I could have mentioned Viacra, I did mention Bar, and I did mention Davarim. That's our Torah. But I took you to our prophets. I took you to our writings. I took you to Brit Chadashah, and I tied you up in the revelation of Yeshua. That's what's woven through Scripture. 
that marks our calendar, that marks our time, that marks our Shabbat, and that marks our remembrances. How do we count our days? How do we count our weeks? And how do we count our months? They all should count one day from Yeshua and see who He is. That He is the God who created and He wants to connect. He wants to covenant. He wants, when you do that mitzvah, He wants that betrothal with His creation. And because of that, He revealed the Redeemer. Moshe is just getting us warmed up. We're going to see the greater Redeemer to come. The Redeemer who we know as Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the Redeemer of Israel, the Redeemer of me. Mm -hmm. And I hope you can say, He's your Redeemer too. Mm -hmm. This is the revelation of the greater Redeemer who's come to bring us redemption. And I want to close this in prayer, and then I'll let you come up and do whatever you want for your closing. <laughs> we praise you, O God, Yehovah, creator of the universe and creator of each one of us. Oh, how we thank you for that love that wants to have a connection with us, that wants to bring us in as a partner in, in a marriage relationship. One with the two shall become one. Oh, Lord, what love. What love. You have written it to us. You have given it to us in 3D. You have shown it, told it. Lord, may we be like that wise child. And if any within hearing have never really opened their heart to receive you as Redeemer, may they at this very moment say yes. I want this from my Creator. I want to put my trust in Yeshua's shed blood and not in my works or anything else I can do. Lord, we know that you see the heart and you know if a heart has opened to you, may they know that right now you have come in and made them a new creation. They've got a new start, a new calendar date, and it stems from you. And for those of us who are renewing and refreshing our minds to the fact that we were there. We were there at Golgotha. And hallelujah, we were there three days later when we see the empty tomb because death could not keep you. You raised, you are alive, and you are our living God. And we praise and thank you that we can have a personal relationship with you. Hallelujah. We thank you. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm.